what it was like to dine first class aboard the RMS Titanic. Titanic is arguably the most famous ship to ever set sail, but it was made famous not only because of its sinking, but because of its unparalleled level of luxury. Titanic had it all, from its lavishly appointed staterooms, to its designated reading and smoking lounges, as well as a swimming pool, Turkish bath, and gymnasium, just to name a few of its many amenities. Traveling aboard Titanic was truly an extravagance, with the price of first-class tickets ranging from $4,500 to $135,000 in today's money. The most expensive of these would have been the private promenade suites located on B-Deck. Like the name suggests, these suites contained a private 50-foot promenade complete with half-timber Tudor-style paneling sofas, tables, potted plants, and wicker deck chairs. In this space, you could have your own breakfast. The suites contained two large bedrooms, two walk-in wardrobes, a private bathroom, a laboratory, and a spacious sitting room. The sitting rooms allowed you to receive small parties of guests. They featured a fake fireplace, large card table, plush sofas and chairs, sideboards, and writing desks. The single berth staterooms on A deck were decorated more modestly. Every room contained a horsehair sofa, wardrobe, dressing table, and marble-topped wash basin, as well as a call button that could summon a steward, a reading lamp, and a wire mesh basket for storing small items. Although the Titanic was centrally heated, the first-class cabins all contained electric heaters. Titanic featured an impressive ratio of private bathrooms to passengers more than any other ship in 1912. Virtually every suite on B and C deck featured ensuite bathrooms. It was standard at the time for the bulk of first-class bathrooms to be shared. And this indeed was the case for the majority of the first class. The first-class suites on B and C decks were richly appointed in 11 different period styles, such as neoclassical, Louis XIV, 15th, 16th, Empire, Georgian, and Italian Renaissance, to name a few. The Dutch design firm of HP Mutters and Zoon fitted out 12 of the special suites. According to their chosen period style, they supplied everything from the paneling and doors down to the soft pillows and down bed quilts. Wealthy passengers also had the option to book multiple adjacent rooms to each other. They could then open the interconnecting doors and create a private suite of their own liking. On April 10, 1912, passengers would board the ship from Southampton, England. They would arrive in carriages or in cars and have copious amounts of luggage and also be accompanied by staff and servants, such as ladies' maids and valets. That evening, passengers would also be coming from Cherbourg, France, such as Molly Brown, John Jacob Astor and his new wife Madeline, and Lady Duff Gordon and her husband. Once you had entered the ship, you would either be on B deck or on D deck. Passengers coming from Cherbourg all entered on D deck. 
Once aboard the ship, you would be in the reception room. This room would be your first impression of the interiors of Titanic. The reception room was not only a room where passengers boarded the ship, but it was used for talking and conversation before meals, as it was adjacent to the dining saloon. Once on board, you would be met by the chief steward and his staff. They would help bring your luggage to your room. Titanic contained 371 first-class rooms in total. There were four parlor suites, 39 private suites, and the rest were single or double berth staterooms. Now let us discuss the entire dining experience one would have had while aboard Titanic in first class. The maiden voyage lasted from April 10th to April 14th. Charles Proctor was the second highest paid staff member after the captain, and it's no wonder why, as he managed 62 galley and kitchen workers, including cooks, chefs, butchers, and scullions, as they prepared nearly 6,000 meals a day for those who chose to eat in the first-class dining saloon. Once you were settled in your room, you could choose to arise whenever you liked. You would bathe, dress, and get ready. If you were a wealthier passenger and a woman, you would put on your breakfast dress. But if you were of more modest means, you would go ahead and put on your day dress and men would wear their three-piece day suits. If you were an early riser, you could go ahead and eat breakfast in your stateroom. The steward could bring you anything from fresh fruit to warm scones, jam, coffee, tea, and other small delights. You could then proceed to second breakfast, either in the dining saloon, a la carte restaurant, cafe Parisian, or the veranda cafe. Although the Veranda Cafe only served light refreshments and light fare of cakes, pastries, and other small temptations. The dining saloon was open between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. for breakfast, while other restaurants and cafes were open throughout the day until 11 p.m. The dining saloon was only open during select times for lunch, dinner, and breakfast, and not the entirety of the day. And here is a real menu of a first-class breakfast in the dining saloon. One could order a variety of fruits, either fresh or baked. There was a selection of fresh fish, a selection of meats, both hot and cold, omelets ready to order, and one of my favorites on the menu, buckwheat pancakes. The a la carte restaurant was the preferred alternative to the main dining saloon and gave passengers the option to enjoy a lavish French haute cuisine, for an additional cost, of course. The restaurant was not managed by the White Star Line, but instead by Luigi Gatti, an Italian businessman who ran a staff of over 60. The restaurant offered two different continental breakfast menus, one being English and the other American. The menu offers almost identical choices to the menu offered in the dining saloon, but there are a few specialty items which you could only get here. Now let's talk about lunch. You could enjoy lunch in the Café Parisien, dining saloon, or the a la carte restaurant. The a la carte restaurant and the Café Parisien featured the same menu, but a different environment to sit in. In these restaurants, you could choose to have lunch whenever you liked. But if you wanted to eat in the dining saloon, which was free with your ticket price, you would need to be there between the hours of 1 and 2 p.m. The menus change daily, but here are two examples of real ones. You had an option of four different appetizers, a variety of grilled meats, an extensive buffet spread, and to end your meal, an extensive display of cheeses. And the same can be said about this menu from April 10th.
If you had the means, as a woman, you would change for luncheon to show off your wealth, style, and the beautiful fashions you had bought in Europe. Now it's time for tea. Individuals gather between 3 and 5 p.m., primarily women. You could have tea in a variety of locations on the ship, such as in the lounge, Café Parisian, a la carte restaurant, reception room, veranda cafe, or your own room. During this time, cakes, pastries, scones, and sandwiches were served alongside your tea. In the reception room, the orchestra played between 4 and 5 p.m. Women were also given the opportunity to change yet again into a light tea dress. A bugle call to the tune of the roast beef of Old England was sounded an hour and a half in advance of lunch or of dinner. This alerted the passengers so they could prepare for the upcoming event, in this case changing and freshening up before dinner. Everyone would change for dinner, all of the first class, men and women, women in their finest and latest gowns, and men in their white tie. For dinner, you could choose to eat in the dining saloon or in the a la carte restaurant. The a la carte restaurant was an extra fee, but it was more luxurious and more quaint than the dining saloon. Give us a bottle of your finest champagne. We have a Dom Perignon 71 at $120. That'll be fine, pal. The a la carte restaurant was sometimes nicknamed the Ritz restaurant as it emulated the Ritz Hotel. Mrs. Walter Douglas wrote in her diary her experience the last night aboard Titanic while dining at the restaurant. We dined the last night in the Ritz restaurant. It was the last word in luxury. The tables were gay with pink roses and white daisies. The women were in their beautiful shimmering gowns of satin and silk. The men immaculate and well-groomed. The string orchestra playing music from Puccini and Tchaikovsky. Dinner in the dining saloon would begin between 6 and 7.30 p.m. Passengers gathered in the reception room before dinner, where they waited for the rest of their party. They conversed and had drinks beforehand. It was the new fashion of the day to have cocktails before your meal, and it was the Americans on board who took to this new fashion, while the Europeans believed that cocktails ruined your appetite for dinner. Unfortunately, we do not know the actual recipes used on the Titanic as they went down with the ship. But since then, many historians and chefs have since recreated this famous menu based on popular recipes of the time and the 1911 bar menu of the Olympic, Titanic's sister ship. These cocktails included a Manhattan and a Tom Collins. The Manhattan had whiskey, sweet vermouth, bitters, and a maraschino cherry, while the Tom Collins had gin, lemon juice, simple syrup, club soda, and a lemon twist. The John Collins was also popular and was the same as a Tom, but with bourbon instead of gin, with a maraschino cherry. Drinking was something Charles Jockin knew a lot about, the head baker of Titanic. He famously drank a little too much the night of the sinking, rode on the stern of the ship, and then ended up surviving while treading water due to the alcohol coursing through his bloodstream, which kept him warm instead of freezing to death like those around him. Now let's get back to the food. Dinner aboard the Titanic was the main affair of the day. Whether in the dining saloon or in the a la carte restaurant, you were treated to an unbelievable feast of 10 to 13 courses. The dining saloon was the largest room on board of any ship in 1912 and accommodated up to 554 passengers. The saloon was decorated in wooden paneling and painted in a glossy white enamel. There were two aisles the length of the room and created a large central dining area. In total, there were 115 tables set for 2 to 12 individuals. Dinner menus changed every day, 
and this menu represents the last first-class dinner ever served on Titanic. Passengers enjoyed at 10 courses that night, with the first being hors d'oeuvre varieties and oysters. A glass of champagne launched the meal, along with canapé a la morale, which was shrimp butter on toast topped with a butter poached shrimp and a dollop of caviar. The oysters were likely served a la russe, with toppings of diced tomatoes, vodka, lemon juice, and horseradish. The second course was the soup course, an obligatory part of any Edwardian dinner. This course consisted of a choice of two different soups, one, consomme olga, or cream of barley. Consomme olga consisted of a clear veal and vegetable stock that was enriched with egg whites and laced with port wine. This was served with slices of sea scallops, celery bulbs, and English cucumbers. These types of Russian dishes were particularly popular amongst the Edwardians, owing to the grandeur of the Russian aristocracy, particularly the Romanov royal family. Cream of barley soup was made with chicken stock and mercois, which is carrots, onions, and celery. This soup is enriched with egg yolks and pearl barley, and seasoned with nutmeg and fresh parsley, complete with fried bread croutons. It has been suggested that the ship carried over 70 types of champagne. Dinners typically served the French reds with the meat courses and the German whites with the seafood courses. The third course consisted of poached salmon with mousseline sauce and cucumbers. This dish was a signature course of the White Star Line and was served aboard many of their luxury liners. The fresh salmon was poached in basic court bouillon made of white wine and aromatics. It was served with thinly sliced English cucumbers along with sprigs of fresh dill and topped with the rich and creamy mousseline sauce made of butter, egg yolks, lemon, and cream. For the fourth course, you had a choice of filet mignon lily, saute of chicken lyonnaise, or vegetable marrow farsi. The filet mignon lily consisted of a fine cut of beef with a rich and decadent sauce along with two of the showiest ingredients of the Edwardian period, being foie gras and black truffles. The filet mignon lily was sautéed in butter and served with artichoke hearts, along with the foie gras and black truffles, in a rich and reduced pan sauce of more butter, tomato, rosemary, and cognac. This delicious steak was laid over potatoes anna, which were thinly sliced and filled with butter, Another option for this course, specifically for those preferring white meat, was the sauté of chicken lyonnaise. This is a classic French dish that was an Escoffier recipe of sautéed chicken breast served with caramelized onions and a white wine and tomato sauce. The third option for vegetarians would have been the vegetable marrow farsi. A marrow is the English word for a zucchini they were normally only available in the summer, but these marrow were grown in a greenhouse for the April voyage of the Titanic and would have been a great extravagance. The zucchinis were stuffed with rice, mushrooms, fresh basil, and Parmesan cheese. The fifth course was the main meal of the evening, and you had a choice of lamb and mint sauce, roast duckling with applesauce, or sirloin of beef with chateau potatoes. You could choose sides of green peas, creamed carrots, boiled rice, along with parmentier and boiled new potatoes. The roasted leg of lamb was served with a fresh mint sauce of white wine, cider vinegar, and shallots. The glazed roast duckling was also available and served with a savory applesauce made with shallots and vinegar. Your third option was the sirloin of beef with chateau potatoes cut into oval shapes to look like jewels and roasted with fresh parsley and great quantities of butter. The sixth course was a punch romaine. This was a palate cleanser and was customary after the heavier courses. The punch romaine consisted of shaved ice with simple syrup, champagne, white rum, and fresh squeezed orange and lemon juice 
and was served with a citrus twist. The seventh course consisted of roast squab and cress. It was wrapped in slices of bacon and roasted with garlic and fresh marjoram, served with a pan reduction sauce of Madeira wine and a salad consisting of fresh watercress. For the eighth course, passengers enjoyed cold asparagus vinaigrette. The cooked asparagus was served chilled with an opulent vinaigrette made with saffron and champagne. The ninth course was pâté de foie gras and celery, being served room temperature on toast. The tenth course was the dessert course where one could have Waldorf pudding, peaches in chartreuse jelly, chocolate and vanilla eclairs, and French ice cream. The Waldorf pudding was named after the Waldorf Hotel in New York City and was a baked custard made with apples, raisins, ginger, and walnuts. Peaches in chartreuse jelly was a very opulent show-off dish during this time. Chartreuse is a French liqueur with a distinctive bright green color and an herbal flavor. Peaches, another summer fruit, would have been poached with cinnamon and cloves. You could also order chocolate vanilla eclairs, made with delicate chudo dough filled with vanilla cream and topped with chocolate icing. Ice cream during this time was thought to be the height of luxury, mostly owing to the need to keep it cold, which was extremely expensive prior to the advent of refrigerators. And finally, as a traditional end to French dinners, a course of cheese and fresh fruit would be served. Dinner could last well into the evening, about till 11.30 p.m. When the meal was finished, the ladies and the gentlemen split. The women would remain in the dining room while the men would go to the smoking room. The room was reserved for gentlemen only, and this was the social convention at the time. Here, gentlemen played cards, gambled, conversed, drank, and smoked. The smoking room was richly decorated and housed the only working real fireplace on board. The rest of the fireplaces were electrically heated. The room was fitted with richly carved mahogany wood in a deep color. There was also mother of pearl inlaid in the wood and also beautiful stained glass which depicted different ports from all over the world. The smoking room remained open between 8.30 a.m. and 12 a.m. Thank you so much for watching Cultured Elegance as we got to go back in time and explore what it was like to dine first class. Make sure to like, share, and tell me your favorite meal you would have enjoyed on the Titanic. Don't forget to subscribe and consider joining our membership program today to have access to exclusive videos and members-only perks. See you in the next video.